Hey, this is Rush Schlecht, and I'm the senior pastor of Eastside Church, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope this inspires you, hope it builds your faith, and I hope it gives you perspective on how God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. Jody Salzman, and I've been there About the same. at the same About time. The same. <laughs> I became a Christian just before I was 20, so Tim led me to the Lord. Right. Pretty cool. Uh, my spiritual journey, definitely part of my life was the scenic route, but I would say since I was about 12, roughly. I've traveled a lot internationally, uh, primarily um, to conduct and teach, um, especially to Asia, uh, 36 trips to Asia. And <clears throat> on a lot of those trips, uh, connected with Christians through God's open doors and um, had some amazing things happen, uh, particularly in China and Japan. And plus I teach at the University of Washington, which is ex extremely international at present. So yeah, it's um, it's just seeing the, seeing the world and seeing the need uh, is, is pretty simple. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I enjoy seeing Jesus show up in a pure way, no matter if I'm in China or Japan or the Philippines or wherever. A lot of people in other cultures, uh, following Christ costs them something. Mm -hmm. The simple, pure devotion to Christ, despite all that it costs people in other cultures, um, is inspiring to be around it, and uh, really lifts a person. Yeah. It's the best way to, I can think of it, to say that. I just love meeting people from other countries. I, I, I always have. Uh, she'll tell you, I, I get kind of obnoxious in public. So I've been struck, I think as we all have, how God is repopulating this church coming out of COVID. Right. And so we've noticed these uh, little pockets of people that kind of sit around the room. And uh, I just couldn't help but wonder how they're gonna connect. Everybody that I've met is just, they're so cool and so interesting and so smart and deep in their relationship with God. and. So it just cries out for connection uh, from one family to the next. We followed that X242 model of just being together in homes, talking, uh, breaking bread together, and then praying for each other. It's, that's really what we do. Like I might read a verse or something before we pray. Um, we're, just, we're just trying to bear each other's burdens, basically. And we've seen really cool things happen that way. And, and going forward, we don't really want it to necessarily be an international group. It's just kind of worked out that way. So that's been cool. And we've just kind of tightened up, the, which you would, when you see Answer Prayer, you definitely draw closer together. I mean, because God's at work, it's, it's just great. And just to have people praying with you when you're going through hard stuff like that is everything. It's everything. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine doing it alone. Can't. So. I just want to be a part of what Jesus is doing. Right. So if all of a sudden, when people are coming back to church after the COVID stuff, um, and our church looks completely different, it's like, wait a second, I want to be following whatever God is orchestrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. We want to make a, yeah. a life in a world that's comfortable. Right. We know it's coming. We know it's next. Every day right. is kind of predictable. There's right. no surprises. There's nothing that's going right. to freak us out and, and stuff like that. And, and I think that's one of the main things that, that I know for sure is that God doesn't call us to that. It's not, I don't think that's his thing. His thing is peace. Right. Peace and comfort are two different things. Right. Uh, peace is when you're with a bunch of people like this and you're bearing each other's burdens and you're going through something together. There's a peace there that doesn't have anything to do with comfort necessarily because you still got to go through the, the junk. Mm -hmm. It's super duper easy to come in the church and get the Sunday morning thing and then bail. I just, I just want to challenge the church uh, to think about community in a real way. Mm -hmm. and, and that community really mm -hmm. comes from these connections of these smaller groups. Uh, if you're not in a small group or you're not generating that kind of fellowship mm -hmm. just in your own personal life, you, you're, you're going to suffer ultimately. You're just not going to get as intimate with, with Jesus Christ as, as he meant you to be, in my in my opinion. And you're not going to have people speaking wisdom into your life that you need to get mm -hmm. through. I, I would encourage everybody to get alone with Jesus and to ask him, okay, what are you doing? And to really take time and listen to the Holy Spirit talking to your heart. and ask him, what, what do you want me to do? And show me where you're going, Lord, so I can follow you.
Isn't that beautiful? We can give the Lord a hand for that. Isn't that amazing? Are the Salzmans here? You guys here this morning? Where are they? Are you ducking down in your seats? <laughs> Hiding? <laughs> you can't hide. Beautiful people, the Salzmans. And uh, Tim, of course, is a professor here locally at the University of Washington. And, and uh, I learned a bit about him uh, from my friend Josh Dunahoo, who's a very talented musician, played in Nashville. He was our worship leader here for a while, and now he pastors out in Oak Harbor with his wonderful wife, Alyssa, and just got ordained, by the way. And so we were over in Spokane watching Josh get ordained and praying for him. And I got to ride over to Spokane in a car with him. And I don't know how we stumbled upon a conversation talking about Tim, uh, Professor Salzman, but we, somehow your name came up. Like it always does, I guess. And uh, we were talking about you, and we were talking about um, musical genius for some reason. And and he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Tim is a freak. And I was like, what? He goes, no, you don't understand. He goes, there, there are great musicians, and then there are freaks. And I was like, well, explain it to me. And he goes, well, here's what Tim does. Tim has, he goes, you know how I'm, I'm a good guitarist, right? And I said, yeah, you're, you're a great guitarist. And he said, okay, well, Tim has a sheet of music, and he'll have... Uh, every instrument in front of him on the sheet of music. So what every instrument in the orchestra is responsible for playing, he'll know every single instrument and what they're supposed to play. And he'll have all of them playing at once, and he'll be able to spot their mistakes for every single instrument in the orchestra and be able to conduct all of them at the same time. And at a professional level, he goes, that is a freak. So if you see him getting bored when he's up there playing worship music and he starts to kind of drift off, now you know why. And I'm like, oh, that makes so much more sense when I see him kind of like, nah, 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 you know, or whatever. During, though he doesn't really do that. He's worshiping all the time when he's up here worshiping. But I was like, oh, I get it. And so he, he really kind of walked me through that process. But anyway, Tim, Tim like he said in the video, and, and Jody's an educator here locally too at Bellevue Christian, and, and Tim has this tremendous heart for, for China and, and people from other nations and many, many trips to China and, and not sharing the gospel necessarily, but covertly as he conducts orchestras over there. But, um, but for him and Jody just to, just to get up out of their seats on Sunday morning and not have some official title in the church, you know, just to be here attending... And then to get up out of their seats on Sunday morning and start pursuing folks, anybody in the room that they see that might be from another country, and just pursue them. And then as soon as they spot that they're new to the U.S., and to pursue them relationally and then invite them to dinner and then start this group that is growing and growing and growing, to me, is just one of the most incredible things. And I think it's, I honestly think it's the best ministry here at Eastside that we have right now. And I love it. And so I'm so proud of you, too and your ministry, and just all that, you've, all that you're doing, and all the folks that are gathering, that you're gathering together and all around you. So thank you so much for doing that. And I've been so excited to get a team out there to finally film it and get it on camera. And that's just a smidgen of all the goodness that's coming out of that. So can we just give a hand to the Salzmans again for being obedient to the Lord and just following your heart that God's put in you. So thank you. Thank you. I love you, and I respect you greatly, both of you. And your amazing daughter, Hannah. All right. Good morning, everybody. How are you? You doing okay? All right, you got your Mariners hangover over with? You all right? We'll be back. We'll be back. And so will the Red Sox. They will buy their way back. The Mariners will earn their way back. The Red Sox will buy their way back. Isn't it fun to watch the Yankees lose? Isn't that so much fun? I love watching them lose. Even if it's to the Astros. I hate the Astros. But I love watching the Yankees lose more. I just love it. Isn't that, oh, am, I, am I just a horrible person? I'm a horrible person. But I love watching the Yankees lose. I just wish they would lose 20 to nothing. It would be so much fun. Anyway, on to Bible things. So we're in a culture now where uh, the Bible doesn't really matter outside of rooms like these. Unless we're in a, you know, a Christian home or something like that. And so you get out there in the world and you try to talk to people about the Bible or Jesus and people just tune you out, right? It's like, mm, doesn't matter. And so, so when you're in college and, and you're in an environment uh, or in a discussion with your friends, you know, and you try to 
justify Christianity with um, Christianity, it doesn't really work. Or you try to use the Bible as an argument for anything Christian, that doesn't work either. It doesn't work as a self-evident argument, really outside of rooms like this or in your home. You can quote Bible verses to your kids or your grandkids, and it'll, it might stick, but you can't quote them to your professor at Whitman or Whitworth or UW or something like that. That's just not going to fly, right? However, when stuff really hits the fan in your life, like when stuff starts to really go bad, there's something that goes on inside of us, deep down in us, where we have these unanswerable questions, where, where, where Jean-Paul Sartre doesn't really hit, you know, where, where Kierkegaard might not seem to really punch, you know what I mean? Where philosophy doesn't really answer it for us. There's something down in there where we're like, mm, it's this deeper itch I have to scratch. And swiping right might answer that for a little while, you know, temporarily. Some of you don't know what I mean. So let me put it this way. We live in a world that is instantaneous, okay? So you can get an instant answer to some of these deeper itches that you have and, and satisfy that, that yearning for satisfaction or, or uh, I want to feel better, I want to numb out, I want to, I want to get an answer now. And you can get an instant answer in our culture right now. In fact, if you don't get an instant answer, you'll move on to something else that gives you an instant answer. So whether that be Amazon Prime, I'll watch something, take my attention away from my problems. I'll order something to take my attention away from my problems. I might smoke something to take my attention away from my problems. Or I'll swipe someone to take, you, you, nowadays you can get a date in like 10 minutes. Remember when I was coming up, do you know how long you had to wait before you called someone back after you got their phone number? How many Gen Xers are in the room? Raise your hand if you're a Gen Xer. Raise your hand. Be proud, Gen Xers. Come on. Where are you at? Gen Xers, how long did you have to wait after you got a phone number? What's the rule? Three days. Who said it? Three days. You do not call before. Who saw swingers? You don't call before three days. If you call before three days, you're not getting a call back. Then you're a little too eager. You call before three days. That's the minimum. The minimum is three days before you call somebody. Nowadays, if you wait three days, you're a loser. Now it's like an hour. An hour. You can swipe now and you've got a date in an hour. What? An hour? And some of you young people in the room, like young, like 19 to 25-ish, you're thinking like, that's a really long time to wait. An hour is like, what's their problem? Like, an hour. And then if that first date doesn't go really well, like great, like amazing, unbelievable, then you move on to the next person. How was the date? Eh, it was okay. In fact, during the date, how's the date going? Mm, not too great. And you move on to the next one. That's the culture we live in. It's instantaneous. So we solve our problems immediately, quick, 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 quick. And then that's, that's one way, but that wears off. That doesn't answer the deeper issues that are really, really going on down in here. They're temporary answers, and they feel good for a while, but they don't answer these deeper issues down in here. Ultimately, these deeper issues have to be answered. This deeper longing that you have has to be answered. And it's not going to be filled by this other stuff. And so these things that seem irrelevant, that seem borderline ridiculous or boring, suddenly become relevant. 
suddenly become important. Suddenly we find ourselves dealing with this thing called emptiness inside of us. And what do I do with this emptiness? Where do I go? Where do I take it? And then we find ourselves asking these big questions and running into terms like God. God. And if you're listening to me talk, then chances are you're asking this question. What about God? What about God? Would you turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 3? If you don't have a Bible, you can get one on your phone quicker than you can get a date. <laughs> It'll be on the screen too. We're going to talk about a young man, well not so young actually, he's probably about 40, maybe 50. But young in his life. And he's going to encounter God. And this is going to be a major course correction in his life. He's going to have an opportunity to respond or not. He gets to choose. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, he led the flock to the far side of the desert, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? But God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. This is God's word. So Moses encounters a massive course correction in his life. He is, for all intents and purposes, this is just the way it's going to be for him forever. He doesn't see a change coming. He's made a really bad decision, and now he's just going to be a shepherd for the rest of his life, work for his father-in-law, tend his sheep, probably have a decent living. I mean, his father-in-law is pretty wealthy. Life's going to be okay. He's not going to suffer for food. He's got a good wife. He's going to be provided for. And there he is up on this mountain. 
and he sees something really peculiar, a bush on fire, but it's not burning up. So I just want to say this to you, that course corrections happen. They're part of life. They're unavoidable. The big correction in Moses' life was his own doing. Moses was raised to be a leader, an aristocrat, aristocrat, aristocrat. We need to watch that movie again. A general. His life was over, and now he was with sheep. He was with sheep for 40 years. Nowadays, we keep jobs for how long? A year or two, then we move on. Do you know that your grandparents kept jobs for their whole lives, kids? Their whole lives. My grandfather worked at Rodland Toyota for 45 years. My grandmother worked putting the state stamp on cartons of cigarettes for 40 years at minimum wage. And as minimum wage increased, so did her salary. She got 15 minute breaks and half hour lunches. And that's what she retired on. And my grandmother still gives us Christmas checks every year and birthday checks every year. That's what they did. My dad moved around a bit more on jobs, but we don't keep jobs like that. Millennials move around all the time. Moses was a shepherd for 40 years. But had God left him after those 40 years? No. Has God left you? Has God left you? Turn to your neighbor and say, no. 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 God has not left you. No matter where you are, God has not left you. I was thinking of a story of someone in the room that I know right now, and they've been in a thing for a long time, and they may think God has left them. And I was going to say, God has not left them. He's not left you. He's not left you. Even if you keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again, he's not left you. Imagine how many times Moses had been up on that same exact mountain. He's not left him. He's not left you. Verse 3, Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. So the big course correction was Moses' own doing. Here's another course correction. Moses had to choose to go over and look at it. It said he chose to go over. The bush was burning, and then Moses went like this. I will go over and see it. It says that. It says that Moses made a choice. And then it says that God said, because Moses made a choice to go over and look at it, I will say to him. It says that. So at some point, Moses exercised agency. I will go over and see this thing. What he saw was strange. It was inexplicable. In view of his reality, it should not exist. Most people are going to come to God because they feel that their life is in a detour. Everything is going wrong when your plans aren't going the way that they want. And even though God appears in a situation, you still have to make a choice. You get to choose whether or not you will engage the situation or not, or whether you will keep on going on your present course. You have to leave your ordinary routine in life. Moses had options. Burning bush, didn't get a good look at it. Burning bush, I don't get paid by my father-in-law to look at burning bushes. Burning bush, I've got lots of sheep to tend to. Burning bush, somebody should get a fire hose and put that thing out. No, I'll go over and check it out. He went over. It says he turned aside. 
Some of you are experiencing in the midst of your situations this still small voice where the Lord is saying, turn aside. In my line of calling, there are lots of loud voices. I call, <clears throat> I'm going to be kind. There are many voices in my line of calling. There's one particular voice that the Lord is using right now that's calling me to turn aside. He happens to be dead. His name is Eugene Peterson. And the Lord is using that dead pastor's voice to call me to turn aside and read his stuff and his thoughts on pastoring and his thoughts on ministry and not pay attention to some of the louder voices. Are you hear, hearing a still small voice calling you to turn aside? Turn aside from your daily routine. Turn aside from your normal advisors. Turn aside from those who would say, this is the way to do it. Turn aside and listen to what God is saying to you. What is a burning bush? A burning bush forces you to think outside the box. It challenges your view on the status quo. Here are some examples of burning bushes. Spiritual emptiness. Some of you may be asking, what if I feel empty but I don't believe that I have a spirit? What if you're in the room and you feel empty but you don't believe that you have a spirit? So there's no such thing as spiritual emptiness. Okay. You just feel empty. Okay. Let's start there. You feel empty inside. Why do you feel empty inside? What is that emptiness? Is your emptiness more than physical emptiness? Have you tried to fill that emptiness with physical things and it's not working? Could there be more to your physical emptiness? Could there be something beyond the physical to your emptiness? Could there be a spiritual dynamic to your emptiness? A metaphysical dynamic to your emptiness? Some other examples of burning bushes, failure, success can be a burning bush, disappointment, loss of a job, a new job, end of a relationship, falling in love. Any of these can lead you to rethink your broken model. So course corrections are a part of life, number two, God is big enough to both orchestrate your course correction and utilize it. Why? Because he's God. Verse 13 and following, who should I say sent me? And what does God say? He gives his name. I am that I am. yod heh vav -Heh. Yahweh. In the Hebrew, that's where we get God's name from. I am that I am. That's who you tell him sent you. I always was and I always will be. Oh, you want to give a name to who sent you? I am sent you. That's who sent you. The one who was always here and the one who always will be. Oh, Pharaoh's God, I made Pharaoh. That's who sent you. God is the God who is not the God we want him to be. Not the God we want him to be. How should we think about God? So let's, here's a great example. Think about this fire. Think about fire. It's beautiful. It's warm. When I get asked what I want for my birthday, which is very soon, 
like tomorrow soon. And my, my wife asks me what I want for my birthday. I say the same thing all the time now. I just want to go to a hotel with you, and it has to have a fireplace. That's all I want for my birthday. That's it. Sometimes I'll throw in other stuff, like little knickknacks here and there, like, you know, whatever. Whatever's on the list for that year. But little stuff. All I tell her routinely now is hotel, fireplace, well, you, hotel, <laughs> fireplace. I don't want to go there by myself. <laughs> that would be so boring. Oh, look, a fire. Oh, this is so fun. No, I want her there. Her hotel fireplace. That's it. And usually the edge water. That's where I want to be with her. And if we can get a water side out room, great. And somebody offered to pay for it this year. So even better. And then that's great. That's all I want to do. I love fireplaces. Why? They're beautiful. They're warm. You know, we have fireplaces in our homes, even though we don't even need them. How many of you need a fireplace? And you have one in your house. You don't need them. You probably have gas heating or electric. And yet we have fireplaces. Why? Because they're so beautiful to look at, right? How many of you were so excited for the rain to come? I was. I was so stoked. I, was, I, I said to my kids when I dropped them off of school on Friday, I said, enjoy the rain. I did. And they looked at me like, what? Enjoy the rain. I was so excited it was going to rain. Why? I get to turn on the fireplace finally. Not just because the smoke was going away. I love fire. But also about fire is what? It's deadly. It's deadly. We serve a God who is wholly other. He's loving. He's our friend. His forgiveness, his grace, his mercy. But he is holy and he is just. Holy and just. Here's a great illustration that I use once in a while, and I don't love to use it because it directly applies to me. Let's talk about addiction for a second. So I struggled for a long time, and I'm still an addict, so I'll say I struggled profoundly for a long time, but I'm still an addict. But I had a profound addiction to pornography for a long time. And one of the things that was like smelling salts to me some of you young people don't know what smelling salts is, but it's like what they rub across your nose when you like get knocked out, right? And you're like, oh, I'm awake now. It like, like wakes you up. Smelling salts to me was that when you're in addiction, it's all about yourself, right? It's just me, me, me. And you become a professional liar and like it's just, you just want to numb out all the time and it's, addiction's crazy. And I was so trapped in this cycle of addiction and finally, in a crazy moment of grace, in a crazy moment of my sanest self, I reached out to a man named Ted Roberts who runs a ministry called Pure Desire. And I called him down in Portland, Oregon. And as soon as I called him and left a voicemail, I immediately regretted the fact that I called him. I was like, oh, God, my life is over. I shouldn't have called him. And then he started calling me for two weeks, and I sent him the voicemail for two weeks. I was like, I'm not answering this phone call. I thought I'd lose my job. I thought I was everything. I thought my life was over. By God's grace, led me through that. Dave Beach was a huge part of that. My wife was incredible. But one of the huge pieces of that was not only was God a loving and forgiving father to me, the grace side of it, but the other piece of that was that he's also my wife's father. And so in that dynamic, he's my father-in-law. And so when you start thinking about it like that, it kind of changes things a little bit. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Some of you are like, is he going to keep talking about this? Yeah, I am, because this illustrates this point, right? Like fire, it's so beautiful and warm, and then, oh, ow, it burned me a little bit, right? Same thing with addiction. Oh, I'm only hurting myself. God loves me. He forgives me. Oh, he forgave me for my addiction. But when you're messing with your wife, and that's God's daughter, well, then it's, he's my father-in-law in that situation, and I'm messing with his daughter. 
And then it becomes this like other dynamic where it's like, don't mess with my daughter. You know, that dynamic. You know what I mean? And it's a totally different landscape. And it took me a second until another guy I had conversation with or I heard her on the phone with another older man crying, talking about her experience. And then I was like, oh my word, what's going on? Like, this is really happening. Smelling salts. That's what we're talking about. So God is big enough to orchestrate and utilize your course correction because this God we're talking about is not a God that like you play with. He's loving and forgiving and gracious and amazing. And, but he's also the same God who spoke and the universe came into existence. So we anthropomorphize God. We think of him like a human, but he's fully God and fully man. All right, let's move on. Number three, God is in the fire right now. So Moses is whining in this situation, which I just can't get enough of. He's literally whining. And if you read further in the text, he whines more and more and more. He keeps whining. Well, what if they say this? What's that in your hand? A staff. Throw it on the ground. Turns into a snake. Great. Well, what if they say this? Put your hand in your jacket. Pull it out. Oh, it's leprosy. Put it back in. It's healed. Well, what if they say this? I can't talk. Well, I'll send your brother with you. Good. You know, and he just keeps going. It says at one point that God's anger burned against Moses. It says that. And then he sends his brother with him. That was God's response to his anger. All right, I'll send your brother. He didn't kill him. So Moses has his shoes off, and he's right in the kill zone, right? He's standing square in the kill zone with his shoes off, whining to God, who's in a bush that's not being burned up, and he doesn't get killed. Why? Here's why. Verse 2. Let's read it. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. It doesn't say an angel of the Lord. It says the angel of the Lord. Who do we think it is when it says the angel of the Lord? John chapter 8, verse 53 through 59. Jesus saying, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I did know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're not 50 years old, they say to him, and you've seen Abraham? Very truly, I, say, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, where did we just read, I am? The one in the bush said, I am. The angel of the Lord said, I am. The same one that just said, I am in John 8 said, I am. Is it possible that Jesus is in the bush saying, I am? Yes. Why aren't you and I destroyed when we whine and complain? <laughs> we have an advocate, one who intercedes on our behalf. Do you know this God, the one who is holy and just and yet forgives and loves? I sure do. I sure do. Through all my addiction, all my brokenness, all my failures, all my complaining, all my whining, I serve a loving and just and holy God who forgives and loves and pours out his righteousness on me. Finally, and then we're going to pray. 
God's course corrections are accompanied by his calling. How do you know if you've had a burning bush encounter? Well, there's a calling that goes with it. Abraham, when his course is corrected, he gets set out on a call. I'm setting you apart, Abraham. You're going to be a blessing to the nations. Now leave. Leave everything. Isaiah, a coal was taken and cleansed his lips. Then he was sent to a group of people that would never listen to him. Jesus said, come follow me, and they left their nets and followed him. Moses, course corrected. Now go back and tell the most powerful man in the world, you're about to lose your free slave army. Moses, Abraham, Isaiah, and the disciples, they all left. They were all obedient. They all followed the call. So here are my questions for you before we pray. Number one, what's your burning bush? What is your burning bush? Number two, where's Jesus? He's right there in the fire. He's right next to you. And number three, where's he sending you? He's sending you somewhere. Chances are he's probably sending you right back where you came from. To take the gospel right back to those folks. It's quiet in here. Are you thinking? Nod at me if you're thinking. Yeah. We're going to pray, guys. I want to pray for you, pray with you. Let's close your eyes for a second. Before we uh, pray about this uh, burning bush moment that you're having, I want to talk to some folks in the room who are feeling an emptiness, and maybe up to this point you haven't been able to identify it as spiritual, but now you have, and yeah, I joked around a bit earlier about how we fill that emptiness, and I made light of it, but you know how serious it is. And I act like I understand your experience, but I, I don't completely understand your experience. I don't. I, I've never been on Tinder and I've never been you. I've never walked in your shoes. But Jesus knows exactly where you are. Jesus knows exactly your experience. He knows exactly what you're walking through. He knows everything about you. He knows every detail of your life. He knows your hopes and dreams. He knows your failures, your successes. He knows what makes your heart leap with joy, and he knows what makes you ache inside. And all he's longing for is a relationship with you. That's it. That's all he longs for. And so if you'd like to begin that relationship today, I simply want to afford you that opportunity. And so for me, I just want to know who I'm praying with. So nobody else is looking around out of respect. It's just me. I, there's no one looking around. I'm looking. There's no one looking around. So if that's you and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus this morning, then I'm just going to ask that you look up at me and let me know who that is. So before we pray about the burning bush, we're going to do that. So we'll start on my right side, your left side. And if that's you, just look up at me and let me know. If you're in this right section over here, my, 
your left, my right. Just look up at me. Let me know that's you. Okay, nobody else is looking around. Okay, center section right here. Got you. Okay, anybody else right here in this section? Okay, what about center section right here? Anybody else? Okay, we don't have to take long, it's okay. All right, anybody in this left section over here before we pray? Your right, my left. Okay, and then far, my far left, your far right. All right. Okay. Let's pray. Let's pray about this burning bush experience we're having too, guys. So, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. And for those that are coming to faith this morning, we right now come before you, Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you would wash us and make us clean. You'd forgive our sins. We invite you to become our Lord and Savior this morning. We invite you into a relationship that we would leave here a different person walking with you. Their lives would be brand new from this day forward. That we would never walk alone. We'd never again wonder whether there is an answer to is there a God because now we have Jesus. Fill us now with your Holy Spirit that you promised. Change us from the inside out as you take the throne of our hearts, Lord, and become our Lord. May we know forgiveness. May we know from this moment forward freedom from guilt and shame. Wash it away right now in the name of Jesus Christ that we would be free. And now, Lord, for those of us in the room experiencing this still small voice from the midst of this experience that we're having, calling it a burning bush experience, we want to answer it. We want to turn aside and walk toward it. We want to answer you, Lord, and not heed the, the voices on the outside. We want to listen to you. Knowing that you're the one who orchestrates these experiences, and Lord, you are the ones who lead us out of it. So Lord, we want to follow you now into this next step, this next step of obedience, this next step into our calling, this next step into wherever you would send us, Lord, from here forward. We respond to you this morning, to your still small voice. We say yes to the I am, to the one who called and now to the one who sends. We serve you and you alone, God. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And thank you for loving us to speak to us. That you have our best interest in mind. That you love your children. And now are sending us out to take that love and that mercy and that grace to others. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, church, why don't you stand?